Welcome to the Scholar's Chair. Tonight, our guest is Dr. Ama Abdella, PhD, Professor Emeritus from the University of Peace. He is a professor specializing in conflict resolution. And here is our interview with Dr. Abdella. Uh, I, I understand that you're not only the Professor Emeritus at the University of Peace, but you also are the fellow, senior fellow at Karama. Tell me, how did your relationship start with Karama and, and uh, what significance it has to you? Thank you so much, uh, Brother Khalil. And uh, Karama indeed is uh, very significant to all the work I have done in the field of peace and conflict resolution from Islamic perspective. Uh, I came to meet uh, uh, colleagues from Karama over 22 years ago. Uh, and that was because of our shared interest in issues of conflict resolution from an Islamic perspective, especially with a focus on issues of women and family uh, situations. Mm -hmm. And the Karama has really provided for me an excellent venue to uh, develop my scholarship and to put it to practice and to train large number of people over the years. And uh, you specialize in conflict resolution. I wanted to find out what inspired you to write and lecture on human tolerance and conflict resolution from an Islamic perspective? I think that goes back to, to of course, many factors. Um, of course, we take for granted uh, being uh, uh, and always interested in exploring the goodness of my faith. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, on, on, uh, on another uh, uh, dimension, I also was a public prosecutor in Egypt. Uh, from uh, the in the late 1970s to mid 80s, and I did study law in the 70s, uh, and uh, part of studying law in Egypt, including studying Sharia, and uh, my study of Sharia in general and the practice of law uh, came uh, at one point uh, in contrast almost with my education later in the United States in the field of peace and conflict resolution. Uh, and that's when I started to realize that a lot of what we are used to understand from an Islamic perspective is very much grounded in the legal interpretations, what we refer to in general as fiqh. And uh, I found that uh, while this is great, and of course any community, any society, any uh, human group needs a law and they need uh, legal interpretations, but uh, our sacred books include much more than the legal interpretations. And that's what I started to discover over and over again as I started to use different lenses to look at the Quran and the Islamic sources. I found that there's so much about tolerance, so much about conflict resolution, not in a legal sense, but in a human sense that has not been discovered, in my opinion, sufficiently. And I felt that that was my calling, is to try to explore in a deeper level those elements of conflict resolution, tolerance, peaceful coexistence, that exists in our sources, but they need different lenses and different tools so that we can bring them out. And then we need to show, to know how can we uh, transfer this knowledge to other people and to make it part of how they live their lives. So I, I quite agree with your, your assessment. Uh, the need is there. I, I am curious in this, um, in this environment where it seems to be this, uh, this intensity of uh, race hatred and um, gender inequality. Tell me, how can um, the, the notion of conflict resolution can assist us in, in how we analyze and navigate this, this terrain? And uh, how it is that Muslims can benefit from, from this science? Excellent. Uh, I think you are really hitting on a very important point, which is, I always tell people when I teach about the conflict resolution from an Islamic perspective that number one, we need to accept that we are humans like everyone else. Yeah. In other words, we share the same motivation that will get us into a conflict. Yes. We, we share in the same dynamics that make conflicts worse. And we also share in the potential of how we can discover peaceful means to resolve our conflicts. Mm. So where is the Islamic element here? where the Islamic element doesn't say that we are different type of beings, but it provides for us additional tools 
that can enhance our ability to, to deal with conflict and to prevent it. So when it comes to issues of race and gender inequality, uh, we all share, of course, on the universal uh, values that relate to this, but we also have from our Islamic experience and perspectives and, and sources, what can even enhance our abilities? What should actually make us the leaders in addressing issues of race and the inequality when it comes to gender or any other factors? When I say history, of course, we all are familiar with uh, at least the story of Bilal, who was uh, the, the muadzin for the, uh, the Muslim community early on. Uh, we are familiar with the story when the Muslims migrated to uh, uh, what is now Ethiopia uh, and were protected there. There are many examples where the issues of nation nationality or religion or race were no factor in how Muslims would bond and connect with each with others. In addition, of course, is that the Quran especially and the practices of the Prophet, peace be upon him, are full of uh, a clear mandate for respecting people and treating them people equally, regardless of any of those yeah. elements. Of course, we need to be realistic and accept that in, in practice, uh, Muslims uh, and Muslim uh, states and uh, uh, at times did not really live up to that kind of ideal. And, um, uh, and we continue, unfortunately, to, to see practices of this type. I'll share with you a quick story from Pakistan that came on the news at the same time that George Floyd was, was killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, it came in an interesting cartoon that showed uh, George Floyd, Floyd in heaven, and there is a little girl sitting on a swing, and an elephant, uh, or a young baby elephant. And George Floyd asks him, what brought you here? And the elephant said that my mom trusted humans. And the little girl said, I let some birds fly. They were referring to two stories that happened at the same time, where in India, an elephant went into a village and the kids wanted to play, so they put fireworks in food that they gave the elephant, coconut. When the elephant ate it, it blew up her mouth and she could not uh, eat or function, and then she died and the baby inside her died. She was pregnant. And the other story of the, um, the young girl, she was a simple, poor young girl from a village in Pakistan. Her parents sent her to a family of affluent people in the city, like we do in many, many countries across, the, especially the global south. And the 10 years old girl, her job is to clean and take care of them and cook for them and do everything as a servant. One of her duties was to, uh, to feed two parrots that they bought expensive parrots. And she would feed them. But one time, apparently, she either uh, wanted to get them out to get or, or forgot, and she opened the door of the cage, and the two parrots flew away. When, the, when her masters, the man and the woman, came, found that the two expensive parrots flew away, they beat up this girl to death. They killed her. Muslims. When you, when you put this in the context of what we were just talking about, about the respect and tolerance and not to discriminate against people because of social class or race or whatever, and to respect the humanity and the, and the environment and all other beings. Yeah. I mean, those two stories, in addition to the story of George Floyd, just really blow my mind. And, uh, and, uh, and we have to take responsibility for our part of this as Muslims uh, when we commit things of this type and to realize that this is in a stark violation of our principles and our guidance coming from our sources. Yes. Tell me uh, this, um, why is it unacceptable to hold hatred and intolerance towards any part of the creation um, of God uh, from this Islamic perspective? I think it is, number one, it goes back to the notion of the unity of God, that we have one God and we believe in one creator who created everything. Exactly. And that with that, uh, Allah has al always emphasized in the Quran mm -hmm. that everything he created was created for a purpose. And that, and also the Quran recognizes that there will be times of tension and times of misunderstandings and times of actually things and get to a level of hatred. But what was the command that, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in the Quran? I mean, you see some beautiful verses, and that's what I learned from using the conflict resolution lenses, as I mentioned. Yes. I found that 
in the Quran, uh, you find verses that talk about when the Prophet uh, meet people who are being aggressive to him, who yeah. are criticizing, making fun of him, mocking him. What does it say? It says, walk away and just depart from them in a beautiful manner. Or say to them something beautiful. It doesn't say then go and fight them. Yes, there is a room, of course, for fighting in self-defense when you are threatened at your existence. But when it comes to people are differing with you, uh, this is not a space for you to even make animosity with them. No, as a matter of fact, that if you read what's in the Quran, it is talking about to make it an opportunity for transformation, to use the, the, the modern language of conflict resolution. That you, somebody comes at you with aggression, hostility, hatred, make it an opportunity to turn things around. So tell me, what is the, the goal of um, human tolerance and, and cooperation and all that? Am I just stating it already? Uh, what is the goal of conflict resolution? Yeah, I would say that the goal is is what we like a peaceful coexistence and the prosperity to all humanity, okay. which is exactly what God wants us to do. Yeah. And uh, we cannot achieve this if we are spending our resources fighting each other. Yeah. That's why we have to strive for peace by peaceful means to achieve peaceful outcomes. Yeah. And that's what has been emphasized. And here also, if uh, I may also just inject uh, another learning mm -hmm. from conflict resolution lenses, looking at the Quran. Um, as a trained lawyer, we especially studied Islamic law as it relates to family disputes and family conflicts. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, we, so we understood all the legalistic elements. Uh, if somebody divorces a wife, then he needs to pay this much. And according to the school of Abu Hanifa, you pay that much. The school of Malik, it's a different amount, and each one of them has great reasons why they come up with certain amounts for the alimony or whatever it is. Yes, yes. Uh, and then, um, and pretty much that's the focus. The focus is if this is a condition where you got divorced or you had a, a custody issue or whatever, then here are the rulings. Yes. And that's what we, they taught us in law school. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what we call fiqh. As I read in the source in, in those verses in the Quran, again, from the conflict resolution lenses, I started to discover that there are repeated words associated always with such kind of conflicts. And the words were things to the effect of the word ma'roof, which in Arabic means the very utmost kind of kindness that you do with people, um, that, that, that they can understand this is kindness. And ma'roof was repeated it was almost with every single verse that talks about family dispute. And I found that, but where is it in the fiqh? Why is it not captured? And I found that it's not really captured uh, sufficiently. And I discovered that this is one of those missing gaps that we need to focus on, that if we embrace that notion of ma'roof, if we embrace it and teach our, our generations that you cannot be a complete Muslim if you only think how much I owe my divorcee, Right. And what does this translate to our understanding of conflict resolution today? It means that you work on de-escalating the conflict and you make sure that the conflict doesn't get worse than it is. Second, you help it to transform the relationship after the divorce in a peaceful way, going to the point you are making. So even though we got divorced, it doesn't have to be ugly. It doesn't have to be terrible, but we can actually live a peaceful, decent, respectful life with each other and that's not going to happen by chance. It will happen by our deliberate effort that reflects what's in our Quran. The same about conflicts on a larger level. I found that the same pattern exists, and I have written about this. I'll be happy to send you some of the stuff I wrote about that pattern of how to deal with conflict from an Islamic perspective. Good. This is excellent. And uh, I can say that Muslims have a basic theological position for, for toleration, um, is there anything that Muslims should not tolerate? Okay. Uh, such as this young girl, that because of her socioeconomic status, and she is a servant, and she did something wrong, she was beaten up to death. Yeah. This is, uh, and here the change to something like this is not going to be just by punishing that man and woman. For I, I know they were arrested and they're going to uh, uh, be uh, serve time in jail, but it is deeper than this. Those are structural issues. Uh, those are structural injustices and, and elements of violence 
that are transcended from generation to generation. And what we need to do is to find a way to how can we trans to tra change this on a deeper level uh, for, for everyone. That takes education, that takes a work of media. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, combined effort to deal with it. Yes, the, the, uh, and I think this, is a, this, um, this idea of confusing actions with a group uh, beyond, uh, uh, beyond the individual, uh, and some people confuse uh, transgressions with the individual. You know, they just, yeah, they just paint the individual with, with, their, with a particular transgression. Uh, you, you're questioning uh, that idea uh, in your in your argument for a conflict, conflict resolution. You, and the question is to you is that is there a distinction between um, the transgression and the individual? Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I have to acknowledge that I was inspired in this notion with some of the principles we have in the field of conflict resolution and negotiations and mediation. One of the principles we use uh, says that when you work in on or resolving a conflict with somebody, mm. you need to separate the people from the problem. Yeah. Meaning the problem is one thing, the person is something else. Yeah. So I may be very upset with you because you've done something that I believe to be very wrong. I need to be hard on that problem. I need to attack the problem and deal with it. But it doesn't mean that I attack you. And the more we make that distinction between, I want to make sure that you know you did something that I re it really hurts me, it really is not fair to me, that I will not accept, I don't have to turn it into, it's because you are a bad person, because you are the problem. I need to find a way to, to actually protect you from that attack. And that actually is very pragmatic, because the more I preserve you and, and your dignity from being attacked, it opens a space for you to actually start to work with me on the same level, yeah. rather than to attack me back. Because if I attack you in your person, likely you will try to attack an even worse at my person. And if we continue to do this, we will forget what we were fighting over and we will be too busy attacking each other. Too much blood. And, yeah. Yes. And I think that the, uh, the uh, Quran is continuously and the Islamic sources uh, are focused on, on issues of this nature. There is always room for people to change. Uh, look at how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he entered Mecca victorious. I mean, he separated the people from the problem in the most gracious way. All those people abused him, ab killed his companions, tortured them, fought him, and what more? And then when he came back victorious, I mean, he could have blamed every single one for the action that they committed against him. But he said what? He said, go, you are free to go. You are the free ones. And uh, because he knew how to separate the, the problems, and he knew very well, I am sure, that by doing this, he is setting an example that would inspire many of them to join in, in his own group, which happened, of course. So actually, that's why I say it's a pragmatic thing. It's not necessary. And as a matter of fact, I believe everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do in our life is done for our own self-interest. It is done for us to be better, to, to gain from it. Even kindness, even not getting into a fight and think that we're going to be victorious by, by hitting at the person, we are actually gaining something. So sometimes on the short term, we actually gain. And sometimes it takes a while before somebody will come around and acknowledge that your goodness and start to, to, to build a good relationship with you. But mm -hmm. you never lose, actually. You never lose by refraining from combining the person and the transgression. But you carry the risk of losing a lot if you combine them. Yes, this is very true. I, I've seen that happen many, many times in my own life. Um, you have written that diversity is an intentional aspect of the creation of Allah, uh, which is a very interesting phrase. Please explain. Uh, that is true on many levels. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all are familiar probably with the verse that said we created you from men and women, so gender difference, yeah. and then we, or, or male and female to be exact, and then that we create and create you of tribes and nations. Mm. For what purpose? And here I have an issue with the Arabic word here. The word is litaharafu. And I think that litaharafu is different from another word that is very similar, which is litataharafu, which 
if it's two T's, لتتعارفوا, it will mean to know each other. Like, hey, I'm Khalil. Hey, I'm Amr. Nice meeting you. That's mm-hmm. لتتعارفوا. But لتعارفوا, it means to increase, increase our cumulative knowledge by sharing with each other what I know and what you know. So diversity here of creating us into male and female and into nations and tribes with each nation and tribe has its own reality and environment, climate, means of production. When we get to do that ta'arafu that the Quran is talking about, mm-hmm. it means sharing knowledge, sharing understanding, so that our understanding of, of our universe increases by sharing with each other. And that, that doesn't happen except if we are peacefully interacting with each other and knowing from each other. That's one element of, uh, uh, of this dimension. The other one relates to, of course, a diversity when it comes to people who do not believe. God said, I, if I wanted everyone to be a believer, and that is in Surah Yunus, I believe, verse 99. Right. If God willed, he, may, he would have made everyone a believer. And then he asked, poses a question to the Prophet والسلام, and say, so are you going to force people to be believers? Uh, yes, yes. And throughout the Quran, it says that God has his own uh, wisdom in why some people will be believers, some are not. Yeah. We need to accept it, but not accept it and say, okay, then we have to fight everybody who's not. No, as a matter of fact, that is part of our test. How are we going to live peacefully with everyone, even when we know that they may never become believers in the way we wish they are? Yes, uh, that is marvelous. The Quran is so magnificent. Yeah, you also have written that trusting in Allah creates safety and assurance. How trusting in Allah guide us to trust in ourselves and others? How does that work? You know, I think that uh, the famous uh, uh, slogan that Muslims have, mm-hmm. Allahu Akbar, yeah. is, is so deep. And I have to say that in my, when I am facing difficult times, in my darkest times of despair, and that happens to me like it happens to anyone else, and I, I reach a point always <laughs> of realizing that the only way I can get myself emotionally and uh, intellectually out of that darkness is to say and recognize that Allahu Akbar, meaning realize that God is greater. In other words, there is a master who is managing all this. And no matter how bad it looks, there he will manage this and will pull you out of it. But you need to start to pull yourself with that belief that God is greater, even greater than that one problem that I am so stuck in and I feel like there's no way out of it. That feeling of uh, and, the, uh, and the internalization of that notion of Allahu Akbar is for me the way that we can, the trust of, in God is what can get us out of calamities and a lot of difficult uh, situations. Not by just saying it. And again, I don't want to be naive or trying to turn people to become pacifists to the point that they don't do or do nothing. I'm saying that that word should be the one that will wake you up, to make you stand up when you are unable to stand up, will make you go to work the next day when you feel like you don't want to go to work, will make you say good morning with a smile to your partner when you are feeling so angry and so hurt. That is what Allahu Akbar will be able to make you do. And if it doesn't, then you need to try harder to make it push you back to where, because the more you start to, to regain control of your life and regain the normalcy, Mm. Actually, the universe in, their, in, in its majestic way starts to transform and change and things go away in a peaceful way. Uh, trusting God, uh, uh, I believe that uh, is, is really a foundation that is a blessing to the faithful. I feel sorry for, for friends and colleagues and others I know who don't have faith in God or declare that I don't believe in God. Mm-hmm. Because I know that what an asset this, I, this is for me and how much it has been giving me the focus and center that I needed so much when at times things were were very desperate. It was clear that from the way Prophet Muhammad organized his his community, he could have really managed things based on tribalism and lineage and blood because that's what they did uh, throughout the, the desert of Arabia at the time. And he grew up with such a culture, but he was a revolutionary. He came to say, no, you cannot come to me with your, what is my tribe, 
what is my my blood, my father, my mother. You are judged and assessed by your actions. Yes, that's one. And that when when he even that that choices that he made for who will conduct what business, it was all based on merit. It nothing was based on because you are my uncle or my cousin or or my blood. And uh, and I believe that in the early stage of selecting who to succeed Prophet Muhammad, everything was based on merit. I mean, regardless of the Shia Sunni division about the choice of Ali or uh, uh, or Abu Bakr, yes, obviously Abu Bakr was not chosen because of any kind of lineage. He was mainly chosen for merit, because it was it, he was assessed based on he was the first among the first to believe in the Prophet. He was the one who gave him so much support. He was his companion throughout. He fought with him. He traveled with him. He did, and he was the one to. Uh, uh, to do the imam of prayer when the prophet was sick. So there were all the indications that he earned the position based on his actions and yeah. merit. Yeah. And I believe that Abu Bakr made an effort to do the same thing when he selected Omar to be next. And when Omar made a, a, a group of six and said that you choose among them, same thing. He did not choose them just because of who they were, but for what they did. Back to your point, Amir, can you separate the people and the issue? Yeah. Uh, and the same with Ali. Uh, all of them were became based on meritocracy. I believe that Islam came with that hope and promise of doing something so revolutionary when it comes to electing people for public office. It is almost like this had to wait for 1,300 years until America came with this concept of constitution and founding fathers and what we were celebrating on 4th of July a few days ago. But I, I, I was watching some of the documentaries about George Washington and about how this all happened and the, in the Declaration of Independence. And I was feeling so sad because I felt like, why didn't we do it? We had everything provided to us at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. What is fitra? Fitra is the human nature that God created us with. And, um, and that fitra is, uh, of course, uh, expected to provide us with uh, goodness. And as a matter of fact, uh, let me tell you about uh, an example of fitra that I translate in my work in Peace and Conflict Resolution. And I give uh, participants or students some of the characteristics that exist in conflicts in general. And one of them is I say, no one wakes up in the morning thinking that he or she is the bad guy mm -hmm. in a conflict time. No one wakes up in the morning thinking that he or she is a bad guy. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I want to give you a chance to summate, um, to offer a, a general sum, summary, because I mean, I could go on with other questions, but I want you to kind of uh, summarize what you've just said uh, about the influence of Islam on, the, on, your, on your understanding of conflict resolution and uh, human tolerance. Thank you. Um, I am fortunate that I made that journey from studying law and Sharia from a legal perspective and then finding my way to come here to the U.S. and to study peace and conflict resolution and to make this my career and in the process continue to focus on my Islamic sources with those new lenses of conflict resolution. In doing this, it helped me to understand my faith and my religion when I go do trainings on conflict resolution, especially in Islamic communities, Alhamdulillah, I see the impact, I see the difference when people, when I work with them, not only giving them the classic uh, Western, if we want to call it conflict resolution uh, ideas, but to show them how to read from your own sources, the Quran especially, and discover the beauty of what Islam is expecting us to do when we are in conflict. Start to realize that, wait a minute, I am not a good Muslim, by only adhering to the legal teachings that were handed down to me by fuqaha, by fiqh. The full story is about being kind and being decent, especially at times of conflict. It is easy for us to be kind and decent when there is no conflict. But the real test is when we are in times of conflict. And I, the more I read from those lenses, the more I discover more beautiful things uh, that are coming from the Quran. It's a matter of changing the lens. I'm not only looking at it from a linguistic, legalistic perspective. I am looking more from humanistic, social science perspective. 